Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. So, very happy to welcome Ivan Corwin coming to us from Microsoft Research in New England, the first uh, SRAM Fellow. And um, for all of us that are still stuck in the Gaussian University class, he's going to take us <laughs> beyond that. Please. Uh, thanks, Yuval. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, yeah, I just started around two and a half weeks ago in uh, Cambridge, in Boston, and uh, I've been having a great time and very happy to, to be the first SRAM fellow, and I hope there are many more. And, you, know, you guys all know this is a, a good thing to, to remember, Oded. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in, in talking about beyond the Gaussian universality class. Perhaps it's a, a lofty title, but let me, let me say that it's not. Um, you know, the Gaussian distribution uh, arguably is one of the most important societal contributions that math has made in the past 200 years. And over the course of 200 years, uh, you know, people have really developed this Gaussian universality class. They are able to compute all sorts of things, and they're able to prove all sorts of limit theorems. And over the course of time, people realize that Gaussian is not all-encompassing. There are Poissonian statistics. There are extreme value statistics. And a theme of the last you know, few decades has been a realization that even these are not sufficient to describe suitably interesting situations that really occur naturally. So what I'll be focusing in are models in which there are highly nonlinear functions of inherent noise. And due to this highly nonlinear function you're looking at, uh, you end up with non-Gaussian statistics. And it turns out, in fact, that despite for a variety of different models that I'll show you, uh, you actually end up with the same statistics. And this is. Uh, this is an interesting phenomenon, and in some cases we understand why, and in other cases we really don't. So uh, this will break into two parts. The first, I'm going to focus on a very particular class of models, and these are models for random growth interfaces in one plus one dimension, which means that you have a growing, uh, a growing curve, and it's, you're looking at the statistics of how it grows in time. And you know, I'll, I'll explain a very simple model and then move into two more interesting models. I'll focus on this third one, this corner growth. What you're really interested in studying here is the fluctuations. Just like any sort of central limit theorem, you're interested in understanding the fluctuations of your growing interface. And it turns out that there are actually two universality classes depending on the parameters of the model. The main one of interest is this KPZ universality class. And it describes the type of statistics and the scalings of these statistics. And actually underlying this whole picture is a continuum object at the interface between these two universality classes, and that's this stochastic PDE called the KPC equation. So this will be the, the first part of the talk. I'll really explain to you in some depth how this works for growth models. Now, you, know, this, you could just take that as being a single, a single thing, and this is its own interesting subject, but it turns out that there are many other fairly disparate uh, subjects which also give rise to the same sort of statistics and the same sort of scalings. And in some cases, we really understand why. And in other cases, it's a real mystery. So I'll, I'll fill up the last part by giving you five different examples. Okay. And if, if the content is not interesting enough, the tools are quite interesting in their own right. So it really involves a lot of interesting math. Okay. So if somebody were to ask you, to come up with the simplest growth model. You're, trying, you know, you're a, a physicist and you want to really understand the way that surfaces grow. And they ask you to come up with it. Perhaps the first iteration, which you would quickly throw out for reasons we'll see, is something called the random deposition model. And this model is given as follows. You have a, an initial surface. We can take it to be flat. And in every column, you have an independent Poisson process of blocks that fall. So blocks fall independently in each column after exponential waiting times. And, well, we can record these, for instance, in terms of these uh, w, x, i. This will represent the time it takes in column x for the i block to fall. And the object that we're interested in, is, in studying is the interface, so the height above a position x at time t, which here would be 4. 
So this is, of course, a very trivial model because of the fact that everything can be encoded in terms of sums of these WXIs. So these are independent, identically distributed random variables. And if you want to know the probability that the height is less than some value, it's equivalent to that the sum of these is bigger than some other value. Okay? So there's this easy property. And then from that, you can immediately compute law of large numbers. So you say that the interface grows roughly linearly with speed 1. And you can actually compute just with this standard central limit theorem that if you subtract off the asymptotic growth rate and divide through by t to the 1 half, you converge to normal random variables. And each one of these is independent for every location x just by construction. Because the processes that were, you know, there was no spatial correlation. Okay. Now, what was the point of, uh, what was the point of spending two minutes explaining to you, the, you know, the first thing that you learn in probability? It's because I, I want to emphasize what I mean by a Gaussian universality class. Okay. So what I'm really getting at here is, I'm looking at a class in which the fluctuations of your interface or of your variables scale like t to the 1 half. This is the very classical Gaussian scaling. And they have a Gaussian central limit theorem. The fluctuations are given by Gaussian statistics. And on top of that, and the thing that really is uh, pertinent here, is that the, there is no spatial correlation. So you have an exponent of 0. So your, your next door neighbors are independent. And in general, when I talk about a universality class, this is what I'm going to be keying in on. This sort of information about the scale of the fluctuations, the spatial correlation, and then the actual probability distributions. Uh, not just one point distributions, but how multi point distributions are, are correlated. Okay. Now, why would you call this a universality class? Well, you know, we, we know that changing the distribution of these WXIs has no effect up to centering and scaling on the properties of this system asymptotically. Okay. Now, this is a horrible growth model from a physical perspective because, well, it, it doesn't really capture any of the, the physical behavior that, that people will observe. If you look at a bacterial growth colony or you know, any sort of growth model, this is, this is not what happens. And, and in simulations and in, and in, uh, and in actual laboratory experiments, see, people see that these exponents are all wrong. In particular, you have a lot more spatial correlation. So in the second iteration, if you want to introduce spatial correlation, a very simple way of doing it is to go to what's called the ballistic deposition or the sticky block model. And now you're moving towards a more physical model. And the rule here is that, again, you have blocks which are falling independent in each column according to independent Poisson processes. Okay. Now the change is that a block will stick to the first surface it comes in contact with. Okay? It just falls straight down, and then it sticks to the first surface it comes to. So what you see is you get this sort of overhangs. And you know, here's another example of an overhang. But again, we're really just interested in, in understanding what the top interface is. Okay? Now this small change, we don't know how to actually prove even a, a law of large numbers. For the, for the, this should grow linearly. It should have a certain speed. We don't know how to compute that, let alone compute its fluctuations. So from the beginning, we're kind of in trouble. Okay? Now, you know, but what are the, you know, I, I, I want to emphasize that despite that, we can still make conjectures about that. So what are, the, what are three pertinent features of this model? And I want to emphasize these because this is what is going to come up when we look at these other growth models, and in particular, this continuum growth model. So there are three features. So one which is obvious, is, which is being illustrated right here, is that if you have these sorts of big valleys, they get filled in very quickly. So in a sense, there's a, a nice mechanism for smoothing out very rough areas. So the first I'll say is that there's a smoothing mechanism. And the second one is maybe not quite as apparent. The second is that there is a slope-dependent, though rotationally, or, or uh, kind of positive, negative slope, independent uh, dependence of the growth rate. So let me let me illustrate this pictorially. So if you have an interface which looks like this, so it has a high slope, and a block falls, it's going to stick, and the height will increase by something like three. Whereas if you had a perfectly flat interface and a block fell, you would only increase by one. But of course, it didn't matter if it was this way or if the slope was this way. You still increase. Okay? So I'll say the second is slope 
uh, dependent or maybe rotationally in, invariant uh, growth rate. And finally, there's uh, some sort of space-time independence or space-time noise. Okay. And, and this is just modeled by the fact that you have here these independent Poisson processes in each column. So these are really, you know, these are the three features of this model. And because of these three features, the behavior of this model is expected to be the same as the behavior of the model which I'm going to focus on, which is that of the corner growth model. Okay, so immediately, so this is, this is the third model, and this is what I'll, I'll talk mostly about. So this model, you see immediately that actually I've changed the geometry. Previously, I was looking at growth off of a flat surface, and now I'm looking at growth in a corner. And the effect of this is it should not change the asymptotic scale of the fluctuations. However, it should change the, the type of uh, statistics associated to these distributions. So there, there is a detection of initial data in, the, in terms of statistics, but not in terms of scale. So how does this model behave? Well, initially, let's say you start out with an empty corner. And then the rule is, is that every time you have a local minimum or a, a small valley, you can fill it in or you can invert it with a box and you do the so at rate q. And simultaneously every time that you have a, a box or a, a local hill, you remove that at rate p. So here we have three valleys and two hills and simultaneously they're all competing to, to, to be acted upon. And for normalization we take you know, q plus p equals 1 and q minus p is the asymmetry of the model. We call that gamma and we take it between 0 and 1. So in, in this case, you can see Q is going to be generally larger than P, which means that there's a net drift upwards. Okay? If Q is 1, then it would only grow as opposed to, to some, something being removed. So the height function, again, is recording this interface. Initially, it's just given by absolute value of x. And the question here, well, the first order question is, is what's called hydrodynamic theory. It's a question of what is the limit shape? If you run this for a very long time, how do the boxes grow? What, what do they look roughly like? And then the real question that we're interested in is studying again what are the fluctuations of the interface around its expected growth shape? And in what scale do they live and what are the statistics behind them? How can you describe that? And the, as I said, the conjecture is that it should have the same scale as this, uh, as this ballistic deposition model uh, but different statistics based on the geometry being used here. So let me show you a simulation of this. This is on Patrick Ferrari's website. This is in the case where gamma is equal to 1, so there's only growth. Okay. So initially you have nothing, and then you, you see the, the red line is representing the asymptotic growth shape, which you can see is a parabola, and then it goes according to this, uh, according to this wedge. And I'll run it to around the time of 1,000. Okay. So what you see is, well, it generally stays above this. So that says something about the centering of the, the, the limiting statistics. And then you see that it actually fluctuates on a very small scale. But if you look at, you know, area between maximum and minimum, it's pretty big. You know, here's a minimum, here's a maximum. So if you did some sort of, you know, you keep repeating this experiment and you want to understand how big the fluctuations generally are here versus how correlated they are transversely, you see that they're roughly fluctuating up and down on the order of 10 blocks. And the spatial correlation, say, between maximums and minimums is something like order 100. You know, this is just numerology. But what are these numbers, 10, 100, 1,000? So the fluctuations are like 1,000 to the 1 third, and then they're spatially correlated like 1,000 to the 2 thirds. OK, this is, this is not math. This is just some, some numbers. But there is math here. So, so what is the theorem? Well, if you look at the height function and you fix the asymmetry to be gamma, so this is the, the drift upwards, then Johansson proved in the case of gamma equals 1, which is the one that I was illustrating, and then Tracy and Whittem more recently for any positive gamma, that if you look at the height function, now in order to make all things equal, you need to, if, if you have less of a drift, you need to run for longer. So you need to run for time t over gamma. And let's just focus right above the origin. So 
the asymptotic growth shape tells you what to subtract, and it turns out to be something like a half t. And then what you show is that if you divide by t to the one third, then this probability distribution that's bigger than minus s converges to something called the, the tracy widom GUE distribution. And it's a distribution function, which uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about it later. It first arose in the study of random matrix theory for the st statistics of the largest eigenvalue of a Gaussian unitary ensemble. Okay? Now, this, you know, this is a growth model, and those are Gaussian random matrices, and why in the world would they be the same in the statistics? And people really still don't have a good explanation for this. Um, now, what I want to emphasize is this, this type of scaling. This is a highly non-Gaussian sort of statistic. In a usual Gaussian statistic, you would expect fluctuations like t to the 1 half, and you would expect Gaussian. What's happening here is you have this characteristic t to the 1 third fluctuation scale. Now, I didn't say anything yet about the correlation between in the spatial direction. But it turns out, at least in the case of gamma equals 1, so uh, Prahofer and Spun show that if you look at two different points, which are, say, you know, 0 and then t to the 2 thirds, you know, t to the 2 thirds difference apart, then their joint distribution, when properly normalized, converges to a non-trivial random variable, or you know, two-dimensional random variable. So it, this shows that the correlation is uh, of order t to the 2 thirds. And in particular, you have this characteristic uh, ratio of, of exponents. So if you look at the time exponent, which is like t to the 1 over, well, t to the 3 thirds, let's say, and then space is like t to the 2 thirds, and fluctuations are like t to the 1 third. So this is a very different scaling than the Gaussian universality class, and then you also have this GUE statistic. Now, all of this, this happens for every positive gamma, 0 0.001, 0 0.0001, as t goes to infinity. But on the other hand, you need to ask what happens when gamma equals zero. And when gamma equals zero, of course, this theorem can't be true. You can't divide by zero. Okay? So from the start, it's wrong. Well, what happens is something very different in, in characteristic. So gamma equals zero corresponds to the symmetric case. Okay? And in the symmetric case, you're growing and dying just equally likely. Now, there is, there is a, a difference. Because you're in this wedge geometry, there's actually something like a hard wall repulsing you. There's nothing you can remove from the wedge. So there still is a tendency to move upwards on account of this. It's similar to a, brown, a, a random walk with a reflection at the origin. Even if it's symmetric, it will still drift to the right, like t to the 1 half. And so in this case of gamma equals 0, you have a law of large numbers. It lives on the scale of t to the 1 half. And if you center by that, then you find fluctuations around that of order t to the 1 quarter, which is fairly small. And they are Gaussian. However, they also have a very non-trivial correlation scale. So it's a, it's a non-trivial Gaussian process. And this is what's called the Edwards-Wilkinson class. So now there's a little bit of a question here. And I'll ask three questions, and this is the first of it. Is that you have for every positive gamma 1 behavior, and then you have for gamma equals 0 and other behavior. And they sit right next to each other. And the scalings are totally different, and the statistics are totally different. So what happens at the interface? What happens between them? How does this work? And there's a general mantra, and we'll see that it holds true in a few cases in this talk, that at these sorts of interfaces, you expect that by scaling into them, you will find universal scaling objects. And that is what this KPC equation turns out to be. But let's wait a second. Um, sorry. So uh, before I go on, let me, let me give you just a drop of the history. So what was known about this, this KPZ universality class? People in physics had been very interested in studying growth models and, and scalings of these growth models. And what had been determined, and I'll tell you just a drop how, um, what was determined was that the exponents should be one third and two third. This was determined by very black magic, non-rigorous mathematics, but it still they had guesses. What came as a complete surprise was this GUE distribution. People had no idea that, that random matrix theory would rear its head in this setting. Okay. Now, so how were these exponents computed in, in physics? I, you know, I'm not going to go into the exact method, but it, what, it, what it relied on was this work of Kardar, Prezi, and Zhang. So Kardar, Prezi, and Zhang in 1986 had in mind that there were all of these growth models that, that people had been studying. And in particular, the growth models involve these three characteristic properties. 
So they were interested in models with smoothing, slope-dependent, rotationally invariant growth rate, and space-time white noise, or some sort of space-time noise. And the question was, how can you determine the scaling properties of these models? But people didn't know how, so what they proposed is, well, we might as well choose the nicest one amongst them. And in general, for analytic purposes, discrete things are sometimes harder than continuum things. So they proposed the following continuous model as something of the typical, the prototypical growth model. So this is what's now called the Kartar Parisi Zhang or the KPZ stochastic PDE. And what it says is that you have, again, a height function. Now it's a continuous height function of time and space. And it changes in time according to three factors. So smoothing term, a, uh, I call it a lateral growth term, but it's the same as this slope dependent term. So smoothing is always just given by a Laplacian. This is the general you know, recipe. If you want something that depends on the slope but doesn't depend on whether it's positive or negative, you could take the absolute value. This isn't particularly nice you know, analytically. So they took the square of the, of the gradient. And then if you want it to be random, you put in some space-time white noise. And this is how they derive this equation. Okay. And then using earlier work of, Foster, of uh, Forrester, Nelson, and Stevens on the stochastic Burgers equation and dynamical renormalization group methods, they made these one-third, two-third predictions. Okay. Now, recall, what does it mean for a, KP, uh, for a model to be in the KPC universality class? It, it says that it grows roughly like something deterministic plus something that fluctuates like t to the one-third and has a certain type of characteristic uh, fluctuation distribution. So, so now the, the, the second and third question come, which is I give, I've given you two growth models. One is a very concrete corner growth model. And on the other hand, I've given you this very continuous uh, kardar prezi zhang equation. How are they related? How is, does one scale to the other? And the third question is, uh, the first time I, I heard it, it was laughable, and of course it's true, it must be true, is the KPZ equation in the KPZ universality class? And you know, by, just by construction it needs to be, because it's the same word. Um, but actually this is a very non-trivial question, because just because you write something down and do some you know, black magic, this doesn't mean that at all that, that it would be in the same universality class. Of course, people have this in mind. You know, that's why the name comes from. They say you know, something is in the KPC universality class if it has the same scaling behavior of this equation. But th there is a fundamental problem in, in all of these questions, which is that from the get-go, this equation makes no sense. So let me explain why. If you're interested in this equation, you need to somehow make sense of this nonlinearity. Now, what the solution, if you, if you remove the nonlinearity, so you tried to think of it just as a perturbation of the additive stochastic heat equation, you can, you know, you can convince yourself and prove fairly easily that the additive stochastic heat equation, if you look at the spatial regularity, so at a fixed time, you look at what the function looks like in space, it will look something like a Brownian motion. So it will have holder continuity just under a half. So now you try to kind of think of this as a perturbation, so you put this back in. But, so you can, al you can always take the derivative of something which is holder less than a half, but you get a distribution, and then you can't square a distribution. So we really don't know from the start how to make sense of this, this square here. So it turns out that there is a good way of making sense of it. And by good, I mean there is a physically relevant way, a way in which this, what, I, what I'm going to give you, actually comes about as the scaling limit of, of real growth models. And it has the correct scaling behavior. And what you do is you actually make sense of it in terms of another equation, which is called the stochastic heat equation with multiplicative noise. So it, it's the following. You have the heat equation, and then you have this sort of space-time white noise times the, the value. So you keep inputting more or removing more information based on uh, z times this white noise. Okay? Now this is a well-defined stochastic PDE. You can say exactly what it means to solve it. You can prove the existence of solutions for, every, for almost every white noise. You can kind of go through. And we're going to be focusing on the fundamental solution of this equation, which is the delta function at time zero. Now how is this related to the KPZ equation? Well, at the first level, if you formally define h to be minus the log of z, 
This is called the hopf cold transform. And assuming this makes sense, which is to say assuming that z is positive, which you can actually show that it is almost surely positive for this type of initial data. Well, as opposed to just plus log? No, it's just, you know, it's the issue of choice of signs. Um, you could have put a plus here, of course. White noise is symmetric, right? So from now on, whenever I take a minus log of something, I have to call it the half call. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I guess in, in the context of uh, PDEs, this is, you know, if people want to solve these types of equations, uh, you know, you, the transformation of Berger's types of equations to... Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's the minus log solution to KPZ. So if you formally compute, uh, you plug this definition, you define H to be minus log of Z, and you plug this right into the KPZ equation, you check, you use the chain rule, you check that it satisfies it. Okay, but this, isn't, this is maybe not the best. This is just a very formal reason. As we'll see, actually, if you interpret the KPZ equation as minus log of Z, then you can show that this h comes about as the scaling limit of real growth models. So from a physical perspective, you, know, you want continuum objects to really explain discrete objects. And this explains the discrete objects that you're interested in. Okay? So, okay, so now, now that we have this definition in our hands, we can actually go about answering these three questions that I asked. Okay? So what are the answers? This is joint work with Gideon Mir, Jeremy Costell, and myself. So, First I ask, you have this very nice corner growth model, very simple. You either grow, you fill in boxes, or you remove boxes with a certain asymmetry. How is this related to the KPC equation? And hand in hand with this was this question of what happens between positive and zero asymmetry. And I said that there should be some sort of continuum object at the interface. So what do we do? Well, if you look, you remember there is this very characteristic scaling of the KPZ universality class. Time scales like three to the three thirds, space or time like three, space like two, and fluctuations like one. So we take time to be like epsilon to the minus three, capital T, this is a macroscopic variable, space like epsilon to the minus two X, and then fluctuations on the order of epsilon to the minus one. This is the usual scaling under which, uh, you know, for instance, these results of Johansson and Tracy and Widom and Prahofer and Schipon, these are the, the results of this uh, type. But now what you do is you take the asymmetry and you scale it to zero. And you scale it to zero like epsilon. Okay? And then what you find, well, recall we only know what it means to, to solve the KPZ equation in terms of this hopf cold transform. So really any convergence result should occur at the level of the stochastic heat equation. Okay? So what we need to do is we define and this is very much similar to work of Bertini and Giacomin. Bertini and Giacomin, they studied not a corner type of geometry, but actually a very flat geometry. And it turns out their work doesn't apply. They're, it, it, it's, this is far out of, their, out of the kind of the realm of their, uh, of their theorem, but their approach still applies. And there's a certain logarithmic correction. And there, things become a little bit more complicated, but nonetheless, a similar sort of approach. So if you define. Uh, z epsilon tx. Now this is a process in these macroscopic variables. And essentially, you know, there are some parameters and I don't want to emphasize them. Essentially what it is, is you look at the height function, you subtract off the law of large numbers and you scale it according to this, uh, these KPZ scalings. Then, well, what is the inverse of minus logarithm? It's exponential of minus. So you look at exponential minus the fluctuations. Then there's this log correction, which wasn't expected. And the result, and this is not the main result, but this is a result you need along the way, is that as epsilon goes to zero, this process converges as a space-time process to the solution to the, of the stochastic heat equation with delta function initial data. Okay. And you can see why the delta function comes in, and you can see why you need this logarithmic correction. If you just take the t equals zero or, uh, distribution, so this is a, a wedge, but it's being scaled because of x, the scaling of x, so it becomes a very narrow wedge. You divide by an epsilon to the minus 1, but that only gets rid of one of these. So you have something like e to the minus a very narrow wedge. And that's becoming a delta function if you put in this correct renormalization. So that's where the initial data comes from. Now, 
what this tells you is it tells you it kind of answers these questions. It you know, certainly answers the first question, but it doesn't totally answer the second one. It tells you that somewhere between the two symmetric and the asymmetric cases, this KPZ and this Edwards-Wilkinson universality class, sits the KPZ equation. But it doesn't tell you how, if it's the only thing there or if it fills the space or anything of that sort. Now, the, this question has a more, there's much more to it. And this brings us actually to this third question, which is, is the KPZ universality, is the KPZ equation in the KPZ universality class? And in fact, we can show much more than that. We can give the solution to the KPZ equation. So if you take the stochastic heat equation with delta initial data, you run it for time t, you look at the minus the logarithm of that, that's a random variable. It depends on the white noise. What is the distribution of that random variable? Well, when you subtract off a constant, this constant, its, a prob it's probability distribution is given by something which we call a crossover distribution, ft of s. And that can be written as a contour integral of a Fredholm determinant uh, with a, well, it's an extremely explicit kernel. Okay? And what, what you should notice here is that for those with, who've seen this, uh, Tracy Whittem GUE distribution, that's written as a Fred Home determinant of a kernel. And the kernel is exactly of the form of the kernel here, except this sigma function, which here is some sort of mollified step function, is replaced by an actual step function. So the airy kernel is just an integration from zero to infinity of this product of airy functions. And this is a, a mollified version of that. Okay. Now, I should remark, Sasamoto and Spohn, two mathematical physicists, simultaneously and independently discovered this formula. They made it no attempt at giving a rigorous proof of it. And I'll remark in a little while uh, what goes into the proof of this. Just, just a drop about that. But what is, the, you know, what is the outcome? Well, on the one hand, here's a nonlinear stochastic PDE that we're able to give an exact solution to uh, the statistics. Okay? But from a physical perspective, it also shows a very nice crossover between asymmetric and symmetric uh, cases of, of this universality. So what is, how does this come in? Well, there's an interplay between the asymmetry and the time. So if rather than looking at an asymmetry of epsilon, you looked at an asymmetry of 2 epsilon or 3 epsilon or 4 epsilon, you would still get a scaling limit. And that 2, 3, or 4, that would actually end up scaling into the time parameter. And the way that it works is that the larger the asymmetry is, epsilon times alpha, the larger alpha is, that corresponds to the larger t is. So what you find is actually that as t goes to infinity, you just do some asymptotics on this equation, fairly simple, that as t goes to infinity, if you rescale by t to the one third, then the statistics converge to that of the tracy Whittem GUE distribution. So what this tells you is that the long time limit of the KPZ equation has t to the one-third scaling and is GUE. So the KPZ equation is in the KPZ universality class. Now, on the other hand, if you take t to zero and look at the short time, which corresponds to moving towards gamma equals zero, then when you center correctly, if you scale like t to the one-quarter, the Gaussian, you convert to a Gaussian distribution, which is exactly that of the Edwards-Wilkinson universality class. So the punchline is that the KPZ equation actually represents a transition or a crossover between these two universality classes. And it's a smooth crossover in statistics and in scalings. And you can see this directly from this formula. So how, how do you prove such a formula? It comes into two steps. And I'll just very briefly tell you what they are. The first step is, is this result on the previous page. It's the realization that you can use a discrete model to approximate this continuum model. And then the second piece of input which you need is some level of solvability. Here's an exact formula. You need some level of solvability of exact formulas for the corner growth model. And work of Tracy and Whittem, which went into this positive gamma result of theirs, this provides the starting point for, for this sort of thing. You need to do very complicated asymptotics and you know, all this sort of stuff. But in the end, you get this formula. Okay. So let me, let me wrap up this first part by giving you just a few open problems and then uh, review, and then I'll move on to a bunch of examples. So here I've, I, I gave you the solution for a very particular type of geometry or type of initial data. The geometry 
remember, is this narrow wedge type of geometry, or a wedge geometry. But another geometry that you're interested in is understanding growth off of a flat surface, like this ballistic deposition model I talked about in the beginning. And, well, that would correspond to a particular type of, well, I guess, height equals zero at time zero. And we don't know how to solve for the statistics of this or prove that this is in the, trace, in, in the KPZ universality class. So this would be one good question. Also, computing more than just one-point statistics is another question that we don't yet know how to do. And this third one is a little bit uh, more vague. There is a natural renormalization for all of these models. It's this 3, 2, 1. So you rescale time like 3, space like 2, and fluctuations like 1. Take any model in the KPZ universality class, for instance, TASAP or KPZ equation. Rescale it according to a renormalization group operator with these scalings. So rescale time and space and fluctuations in the scale. It should converge to a fixed point. That fixed point is actually more important, in my opinion, than the KPZ equation itself, because that fixed point is the fixed point of any model, whereas KPZ equation requires this weak asymmetry. Describe and compute the statistics of, the, of this model. Of course, we know some stuff about this fixed point. We know it's one-point distributions, and we know it's fixed time distribution, but compute the whole structure of this fixed point. This is an interesting question. So to, to review this first part, we, we looked at a, a few different growth models, and we saw that underlying these growth models is really two universality classes. The main one I focused on was this KPZ one, because it involves very interesting phenomena, and it's much larger in a sense. And underlying this is, and going between this, is this KPC equation. And we've been able to actually give an exact solution to that. Now, what I want to do now is I want to fill out this KPC universality class with a bunch of other examples. And generally, we know that the Gaussian universality class, there are lots of things that are Gaussian. And there's good reason, which is that you can prove you know, under weak hypotheses and you know, fairly weak linear combinations of roughly independent stuff, ends up being Gaussian. So is there a general theory here for when something will have these random matrix type distributions? And the answer is, as of yet, no. Uh, but in certain cases, we can, we can prove a fair amount. So uh, I'll talk about these five examples. And within each class of example, there is some level of universality that should be expected. And what this really means is that if you have a type of model and there are some natural parameters to tweak, then tweaking these parameters should really not have an effect on the asymptotic behavior. So in terms of growth models, if you change the local rules, as long as it has these three properties, you really shouldn't have much of an effect on the, on the asymptotic behavior. Uh, and in some cases, you can see why each one is universal in its own right, and then as to why they're all connected, well, this is a little bit vaguer, and there's not a great answer in general. So, so what is the, the first of these? models is that of interacting particle systems. Now, an interacting particle system is essentially a system of particles that interact. And the poster child of this would need to be something called the simple exclusion process. And that is given by particles sitting on the lattice. Okay, so now, now we've kind of we've transitioned to particle systems. You'll see very quickly it's equivalent to growth models, actually. And these particles are trying to articulate independent continuous time random walks, jumping to the left at rate p and to the right at rate q. And the only rule is that their interaction is that they exclude each other. So if this guy tries to jump left or right, he can't because this spot is taken. Okay? So it's like a, a model for cars where the cars decide to go backwards and forwards. It's a very bad model for cars. If, if you have them all going the same way, it's a, not as bad, but still a pretty bad model for cars. Um, now, if if you actually take a, basically an integration of these particles, you get a growth model in the following way. So imagine, let's say, that you start out with an infinite number of particles to the left of the origin and an infinite number of holes, so no nothing to the right. Now, above every particle, you associate a little increment of slope minus 1. And above every hole, you have a slope plus 1. So what initially that means is that you have all minus 1 and then all plus 1, a corner. And now every time that a particle jumps, you make the either, in this case, you, know, you have a minus 1 and then a plus 1. When the particle jumps, you need to switch the two. So that's equivalent to filling in this box or inverting a valley into a hill. And likewise, when a particle jumps the other direction, you turn a hill into a valley. So you see, actually, that 
this model and the, uh, the corner growth model are coupled uh, at the most fundamental level. Okay? But what's nice about this is that it's very easy to now tweak this, corner gr this, uh, this particle system and now here are a bunch of open questions. If you tweak it in any degree, prove that nothing changes. Okay? And essentially, we don't know for any tweaking of this model that it stays the same. So for instance, uh, one can ask about what if the particles jump more than just to their nearest neighbors? That shouldn't change things much, right? But we don't know how to prove it. Prove that, you know, th these two types of jumps. Or, you know, what might actually be easier, it, it's generally easier to prove, con when you have a continuum object, it's easier to prove convergence to that continuum object. So take the asymmetry between the jumps, so, you know, you have a certain mean jump distance, take that to go to zero like epsilon and do all this rescaling, prove you converge to the KPZ equation. Again, we don't know how to do it. Other perturbations is you can have a, some sort of location dependent or environment dependent jump rate. For instance, you're not just affected by a particle to your left and right, but by particles a, a little bit of a distance away from you. Um, and, and again, we don't know how to do this. Weaker forms of exclusion where particles can jump on top of each other, just don't like doing it, and they're zero range or finite range processes. Each one of this type of perturbation should not change the asymptotic behavior of this model. However, uh, as of yet, we don't have the techniques to prove this universality. Uh, so ideas are welcome. Now, now I'm going to, I'll give you a different way of keeping track of this corner growth model. And this will move us into the study of polymers, directed polymers, which is something slightly different now. And this is another model which is in the KPZ universality class. So how does this work? Well, I'm going to focus for the moment on gamma equals 1. So remember that we have the corner growth model. And when gamma is equal to 1, you only have growth. So if, if you want to keep track of this model, one way of keeping track of it we saw was to have a height function and keep track of the, how the height function grows in time. Another way is to just keep track of the time it takes to reach different points. The time that it takes for a point, you know, for a box to get grown from time zero, certain time. And this is actually what we define as the last passage time. So Lxy is the time when box xy is grown. This is gamma equals one. So it turns out that there's a very nice way of keeping track of this. If you want to know the time it took box xy to get grown, so for instance, this box to get grown, well, we know that this box and this box need to have been grown. It's two parents, essentially, need to have been grown. And once these parents have been grown, then there's a waiting time. And because everything is independent and it's a Markov process, the waiting time can be specified actually from the start as just wij being an exponential random variable of rate 1. So what that actually tells you is that if you want to compute this lxy, then you can compute it in terms of its two previous neighbors plus the additional waiting time for that box to grow. Okay. Now because of the connection with the corner growth model, you can write down, and you can use this result of Johansson, to write down the exact uh, scaling properties of this. So it grows roughly, if you look out in a direction uh, xy and times a large variable t, then it behaves like some deterministic time it takes to get there, plus fluctuations, and the fluctuations are t to the one-third and have this Tracy Whittem G we characteristic property. Now here's another open question. This is a big open question now. Here I specified these WIJs to be exponentially distributed. What if you change them to be anything else? Sufficient moments, let's say at least five or six moments. There's a little bit of an argument about how many moments you need. But let's say Bernoulli, 0, 1. Okay, 50, 50, 0, 1. Prove the same sort of result. Now, a priori, there's a big problem, which is that aside from exponential distribution and, and the discrete analog, which is geometric, you don't even know what this term is. You don't even know what the law of large numbers is. So it's very hard to prove a fluctuation result when you don't even know what to center around. But nonetheless, maybe it's possible. And we'll see that there are some indications that this really should be true, but it, it's only in, a, in what's a very high temperature regime. So what, what do I mean by this? Well, if we take this recursion and we iterate it, you iterate it until you get this following form. So Lxy can be written in terms of 
the weights of all of its predecessors in the following sense. You look at the collection of paths between the origin, written here as 1, 1, and the box that you're interested in. And you focus only on directed paths, which are paths that go up and to the right or up and to the left. Okay? And you take the maximum over all such paths of the random variable t of pi, where t of pi is the sum of the weights along the path. So you kind of think of these as being pots of gold and you need to follow the city street lines and you want to get the most gold. Okay? And that's what this passage time is. So it's the maximum over all these paths. So here's just an example. Now why, why is this a polymer, discrete polymer ground state? Well, what a polymer is, a, a directed polymer, is a measure on paths. And it's given in terms of a random environment. And this is the zero temperature version of that, of that model. So in general, a polymer measure assigns a Boltzmann weight, which is just given here, uh, to a collection of paths directed in a, with respect to a disordered environment. So in particular, what you do is you look at this t of pi. So this is a, a essentially a discrete path integral. It's the sum of the weights along your path. And you weight a, a path saying that it's taken proportional to the exponential of beta times that random variable. Okay. Now, you need to renormalize this by a to make it a probability distribution by the partition function, which is the sum over all paths of these weights. Okay. So what happens, for instance, as beta goes to, beta is called the inverse temperature. So beta going to infinity is like temperature going to zero. When beta is going to infinity, you find that the longest path is the one that's favored the most. In a sense, it, it becomes the only path that's taken. Okay? Now you can make this precise, for instance, let's focus on uh, the set of paths which again go between 1, 1 and x, y. And then if you look at the free energy, which is logarithm of z divided by beta, then as beta goes to infinity, this actually converges to the, this last passage time, l, x, y. Okay? Now again, the conjecture is that for any beta positive, if you look at this free energy and you take t to infinity, it will behave like something deterministic plus something that fluctuates like t to the one third. Okay. Uh, the reason for this, so why you might ask why for any beta? We know it's true for beta equals infinity. That doesn't mean it's true for beta equals a million. Well, the, the belief is, is because there is this concept of strong and weak, uh, strong and weak disorder. And what's been proved is that in these sorts of one plus one dimensional polymers, for any positive beta, you're in the strong disorder regime, which means essentially that the path measure is actually affected by the noise. So it's only when beta equals zero, in which case this just becomes the trivial uniform measure. It's only in that case where the noise doesn't matter. For every other, no, every other beta, the noise has an effect, and this is where this conjecture would come from. Now, this is not known for any positive beta, but what is known is again that if beta goes to zero, and this is totally analogous to this weak scaling of gamma. So here we have two universality classes. You have positive, or I'm sorry, you have strong disorder and weak disorder, positive beta and zero beta. And if you take beta going to zero and you rescale the other parameters, then again, the partition function, let's focus on that for the moment, this converges to a non-trivial object. And what is it? it actually converges to the stochastic heat equation with multiplicative white noise. Which is, in other words, to say that its logarithm, now there's a question of the minus sign, its logarithm converges to minus the stochastic, minus the KPZ equation, it's up to a, a little bit of a shift. And this observation was made recently by Alberts, Kahan, and Costell in math, and actually also a little bit earlier actually in physics by uh, Calabresi, Ledoux-Sal, and Rosso, though Alberts, Kahan, and Costell have a scheme to prove this. Um, it's fairly simple, actually, to prove this in terms of chaos series. So what, what's really going on is the following. You have this polymer. You're taking a scaling limit of the polymer. And as beta goes to 0, you're converging to the stochastic heat equation. And the reason for it is the following. If you look, if you remember this, this recursion I gave you here for the last passage time, there's an analogous recursion for the partition function. The partition function at time x, y is written in terms of its previous case, except the max plus goes to plus multiplication. This is the tropicalization of the problem. And that recursion is nothing but a discrete version 
of the stochastic heat equation with multiplicative noise. You can kind of work it out and see. And so what's really going on is that this scaling of beta is the scale in which the discrete white noise converges to continuum white noise. So that's where this result comes from. Now why in the world would we expect the KPZ equation should come up, or the stochastic heat equation should come up in the world of polymers? It's because of the Feynman-Katz formula. And what it says is that, if you remember, the stochastic heat equation with multiplicative noise, it was the Laplacian plus a potential, which is space-time white noise, times z. And this is the general form for Feynman-Katz. And this, if, the, if it was a deterministic potential, you would just have that you can write this, this solution in terms of an expectation over Brownian motions, or in, I've done a little normalization by the heat kernel to make it Brownian bridges, uh, of exponential of the path integral of the Brownian motion or Brownian bridge through the potential. Now what happens here is that, of course, the potential now is random and it's very degenerate. And there's a certain type of renormalization. It's called a Wick renormalization. But nonetheless, you can still think of the, the heat equation as giving as being the polymer partition function for a, a continuum polymer in a space-time white noise environment. So w the punchline, again, of this is that if you look at the free energy of this, which is just the logarithm, our result proves that the free energy, minus some terms, its probability distribution is given by that of these crossover distributions. So what this says, actually, is that in a sort of double scaling limit sense, as beta goes to zero, that, that, that there is universality. So it's this weak form of universality. Okay, okay so let me, let me start to, to wrap up. I have a few more examples, but I'll be brief. I know that it said till 5, but I'm not going to take, I, I don't want to go much over 4.30. So now let me transition to something completely classical. So here we've been talking about all these polymers. This actually is also a polymer, but something called Ulam's problem, or random partitions also comes up, but what you do is you look at a uniformly chosen prob uh, um, yeah, permutation. You write it in two-line notation, so one goes to five, two goes to two, so on. And you look at the longest increasing subsequence of the second row. Okay. This is a random variable, or it's a function of the permutation. You think of it as a random variable. Here it's five. And Bike, Dyfed, and Johansson showed that uh, I'm choosing normalization. I'm looking at a permutation of length n squared. It could be anything, but it looks nicer that way. You look at that random variable, subtract off its law of large numbers, which turns out to be 2n, divide by n to the one-third, and this converges to the GUE distribution. This actually was the result that kicked it all off. This was where we, people first kind of discovered that these GUE distributions were coming up elsewhere uh, besides random matrix theory. And what was underlying this is really this robinson shenstead correspondence, or Knuth uh, correspondence, uh, which is a correspondence between permutations and certain uh, combinatorial objects, partitions, which also have interpretation in terms of representation theory and the sorts. Um, turns out, actually, there, there's a, an interesting world of tropical combinatorics in which there's a tropical RSK correspondence. It corresponds to positive temperature polymers, and you can actually use similar techniques there. Now, so this, this was the this result of Bike, Dyfe, and Johansson. Now, let me contrast this to the earlier work of random matrix theory. And you'll see I copied and pasted a formula. Uh, now, OK, so this is, this is random permutations. Now random matrix theory. And just because the word random comes in, it doesn't mean that they should be the same. But it turns out that they are, at least near the edge. So let me tell you a little bit about random matrix theory. Just a, I would be negligent if I kept talking about the GUE but never said anything about it. So the Gaussian unitary ensemble is it's a, basically it's a Hermitian, it's an ensemble of Hermitian matrices which are given by complex Gaussians off diagonal and real Gaussian on diagonal. That, that's all you got to know, really. And uh, what Tracy and Whittem discovered was that if you look at the eigenvalues, these will be random, you look at the largest eigenvalue, and you subtract 2n divided by n to the one third, then its probability distribution is given by the, okay, we're not going to do that crowd thing, <laughs> by the trace of them, GUE. Okay? And of course, that's where the name came from. Um, now, why in the world would it come up in both contexts or all these other contexts? There really is still some mystery. Lots of very smart people have thought about this. So Kunkov, 
I wrote a very nice paper about this and the connections to algebraic geometry. But still, all of the connections between growth models and particle systems are, in a sense, at the level of counting. Okay. Now, within random matrix theory itself, this KPZ scaling is ubiquitous. It's universal. And this is perhaps the most universal that people have been able to prove. Uh, so what is known, just briefly, one slide on it. Uh, there's been a lot of recent work also. So the GUE distribution sits in two camps. It's both a Wigner and an invariant ensemble. So a Wigner matrix just means that you can take these Gaussians on and off the diagonal, and you can replace them by some other type of distribution. Okay? And the, the result is, and this was first shown under some, some fairly strong assumptions by Sashnikov using combinatorial methods, and then more recently, Erdős Yao, Schlein and others, and then Tao and Vu uh, strengthened all of these results, different methods, that there is universality, which is to say that the actual properties of these distributions up to uh, the you know, knowledge of the first few moments really doesn't play a role. So there is universality. You get the same statistics in the, of the edge, okay? and also in the bulk. Um, the other property is this of being an invariant ensemble, which is essentially saying that the eigenvalues sit in a certain potential. And again, the potential corresponding for the eigenvalues in GUE is a polynomial h squared. Universality says that as long as it looks something like h squared, which is to say a polynomial with even degree, positive leading coefficient, you should have the exact same edge statistics. And this has actually also been strengthened by Erdős, uh, Yao, and, and others. Uh, let me finish off with, with the last thing. And I just want to give a picture. And you guys will all know this picture because I saw it up on the second floor. Uh, it was produced by David Wilson. Now, this is that of uh, studying non-intersecting random walks and tiling problems. Okay? And we kind of know what we should be looking at now, because I've been talking about last, longest, top eigenvalue. So what you do is you look at, let's say, four random walks. And you look at the uniform distribution on all paths that start and end in the same points, uh, but never touch in, in, in between. Okay? And you can associate a tiling to this by associating every up one has a little rhombus that points upwards, every down step has a pointing down, and everything where there's nothing to do, you put a diamond. And you could erase it, and you get this nice tiling, or if you stare at it a little longer, it's a filling of a, of a corner of a room with boxes. Okay. Now, we know how to study this. There are various tools because of this non-intersecting property. But, but where does the KPZ universality class, where does this stuff come in? It comes in at the edge, at the top. So if you look at the trajectory of the top guy, you see in this vicinity it's fluctuating. And it turns out, and there are results to this extent, that the top line, as n goes to infinity, n being the side length, fluctuates like n to the 1 third, has GUE as its distribution, and also has correlation of order n to the 2 thirds. So these same 1 third, 2 thirds scalings. And what, this, is, this is the distribution of the uh, boundary of this Arctic Circle, uh, Kahn, Larson, and Prop. And of course, you can ask for lots of other types of universality, uh, tiling other shapes, non-uniform measure, different types of repulsion of particles. And again, for the most part, we don't know much about this. So there are all of these questions. And you see that there are all of these directions of universality. And what we've done is kind of uncovered the statistics which should be universal. And in some cases, have been shown to be universal. And in other cases, have not been shown to be universal. Now, we know that, that Gaussian, and so let me conclude. We know that the Gaussian distribution really comes up for a functional reason. It is, in a sense, this unique object, which is when you have roughly independent random variables co combined in roughly linear ways, you get it. Now, all of the models which I've shown you take well, essentially independent random variables and combine them in very nonlinear ways. But it's kind of different nonlinear ways. Yet you still end up with the same outcome. So there's a real mystery as to is there a functional description? You know, I take a black box, I input random data, I get out. If I get out GUE, what was the black box like? This would be a very interesting question, but we don't have a great description. You know, something like the GUE is the fixed point of a certain Fourier transform property, any of this sort of. We don't know how to do that yet. Um, but nonetheless, we have made a fair amount of progress, especially in understanding recently this KPZ equation, which 
really does underlie a, a large part of this KPG universality class. Um, it's, a, it's very, you know, these, these things touch a lot of areas. Of course, there are lots of mysteries. And, and you know, just it's kind of a, an analogy to, to where we're at, you know, so 200 years ago, you know, this, the Gaussian distribution was discovered and people started to do a lot of work with that and there were two directions that it went in, right? And one direction was proving the universality of the Gaussian distribution, that not just uh, simple, you know, so, so you, originally it was proved for simple symmetric random walks by explicit asymptotic analysis. This was the work of Dumov. Now, of course, people found nicer ways to prove this and they proved it in much greater universality. And these were the two directions, computing things about the G Gaussian and Gaussian processes and proving universality. And we're very much still at the early steps if we have a few solvable models and we can prove in a few cases universality, but we don't have a great description as to, as to why all of this comes about. And well, you know, hopefully it won't take 200 years to get that. But thank you, thank you very much. property that characterizes this GV distribution, maybe something analogous to the Gaussian maximizing entropy for given variance. And the second huh? question is why do we believe in universality? I mean, for random matrices, okay, there's something there, but if your model isn't coming from random matrices, should we really believe this? Why is there something there for random matrix theory aside from the fact that we can prove it? <laughs> um, okay, so, so for your first question, in a sense, I, I can, well, no, but th there is some, something to that extent. So let me tell you just a, one thing. So if you look, um, so there's work that I've been doing with Alan Hammond on looking at non-intersecting line ensembles. So if you look at one of these sorts of ensembles I was just showing, or you look at Brownian bridges, condition not to intersect and you take the number of Brownian bridges to infinity and you look near the edge of the kind of shape and you look in a scaling window, you find that the top Brownian bridge is, that, is given by an airy process whose marginal is the Tracy Whittem GUE distribution, okay? Now, th in the scaling limit, it, there's a certain property which is also true in the finite limit, which is that of, if you look at the collection of lines, they have a, a Gibbsian property, a Brownian Gibbs property which means that if you take one of the lines and you erase it, you can resample it according to a new Brownian bridge conditioned not to touch the line above it or below it. And we in fact believe that if you look at the whole collection of lines in this edge scaling limit, then it's a un there's up to some sort of spatial invariance property. This is the unique set of lines that has this Gibbs property. So in a sense, the, the GUE if this, is, if this conjecture is true, the GUE is the unique marginal, kind of top line marginal of a, such a Gibbsian line ensemble. So it's a little bit of a, of kind of, a little bit of what you're asking. It's not quite. As far as universality, why things should be universal, uh, you know, by analogy is one example. There is, you know, you can see actually, if you look at some of, let's say a particle system, you can write down the generator of the particle system and you, you can kind of do some formal manipulations and you can see that things kind of look like they should be going to the KPZ equation. You know, at some formal level, you can kind of pick out the KPZ equation. So, you know, they're very formal calculations, but also simulations, these are. Thank you, I think we have to finish, so I will be here for another few hours. Yeah, or? as long as people want to talk. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot.